My dearly beloved in Christ, for our sermon this morning, I would like to simply go through today's gospel, this event which we reflect upon every time we pray the fifth joyful mystery of the rosary. So we'll simply go through it and comment on several aspects. Now, first of all, this loss of the child Jesus in the temple was a great sorrow for our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. For parents, there perhaps is no greater trial than the loss of a child, even for a short time. But with our Blessed Mother, many commentators believe that this, the third of her sorrows, was the greatest sorrow of all, because she did not know why our Lord had taken himself from her. Had she done something to offend him? Would she even ever see him again? It was a terrible sorrow. And of course, our Lord did so in order to teach them and us a lesson that the will of God, the things of God, must come before all else. Did you not know I must be about my father's business? That when it comes to God's will, that always must come first. And this reminds us of what we reflected upon last Sunday, was the Feast of the Holy Name of Jesus. And there is the story told in the book, The Acts of the Apostles, how Peter and John, this was very shortly after the resurrection of our Lord, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. And there was a beggar there who was lame, sitting by the temple, by the gate. And he was asking for alms. And Peter, St. Peter said to him, Gold and silver I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, arise and walk. And this man who had been lame all his life was instantly cured. And there was such a commotion over this wonderful miracle that the apostles were taken before the chief priest. And they forbade the apostles any more to preach the name of Jesus. And St. Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. We cannot neglect to preach Jesus Christ, who has risen from the dead, whom you crucified. No power on earth can stop us from preaching the truth. And so our Lord gives a similar lesson in today's gospel where he says that he must be about his father's business. And that came even before the obedience that he gave to Mary and Joseph. And it is interesting to note that this incident is the only one that is mentioned concerning our Lord's childhood or youth. Because we have the events of his nativity and then the angel telling St. Joseph when the Magi had gone back another way to their country and Herod realized that he had been deceived, that the Magi were not going to come back and tell him where the Christ child was. In his fury, he slew all of the baby boys in Bethlehem and all the surrounding area. And the angel had revealed to Joseph that he should take our Blessed Mother and the Christ Child, and flee into Egypt. So we have that incident related in Scripture. And then we have today's incident. And then the next one is the baptism of our Lord at the age of 30. So this loss in the temple for three days at the age of 12 is the only event narrated of the entire time from our Lord's infancy up to the age of 30. Obviously, it is a very important lesson for the Holy Ghost to reveal it to us in Holy Scripture. And so I already mentioned about how the our duties to God must come before everything. But also notice that what did our Lord do in the temple during those three days? 
It says he was among the doctors, the learned men of the temple, listening to them and asking them questions. And Cornelius Alapid makes an interesting observation here in this regard, and that is by asking questions a person can teach. In fact, this was the famous method of Socrates called the Socratic method. So let, it, let me read from Cornelius Alapid. Our Lord was asking them questions first because it was fitting that the child should ask questions of these learned men and not teach them. Yet Christ in asking questions taught them, says Origen, for to ask questions wisely is as much the mark of a learned man or a learner as to answer wisely. Thus learned masters wisely teach their disciples by questioning them. And of course, our Lord was in all regards their master. And they were amazed at his wisdom and his answers. And what did our Lord ask them about? Many scripture commentators said, say that our Lord asked them, what does this mean and what does that mean referring to prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah and he was trying to bring their minds to the realization that the time for the coming of the Messiah is at hand the number of weeks of years that had pro been prophesied by Daniel had been fulfilled also the prophecy of Jacob to his sons that the scepter would not pass from the tribe of Judah until the Messiah would come. And now it had passed to the Romans and other prophecies. So our Lord taught them by asking these questions to get them to realize, wait a minute, this was prophesied and that was prophesied of the Messiah. And these things are being fulfilled. His time is at hand. Our Lord wanted them to realize when he would begin his public life some 18 years later that the time was at hand for the Messiah. Now, one of the things that most troubles us perhaps about this event in scripture is why? Why did our Lord do this to our Blessed Mother? If it was such a great sorrow to her and to St. Joseph, Imagine, St. Joseph took all the blame on himself. He was the head of the Holy Family. And our Blessed Mother, on the other hand, blamed herself. And so both of them were in such great sorrow over this loss until they found our Lord on the third day. And as I've mentioned before, the reason how, or the manner in which this happened was that the men and women from a particular town, in this case Nazareth, who would go to Jerusalem for these feast days, this was for the Passover, would travel in a caravan in a group for protection. And the men would travel separate from the women. The children who were younger, under the age of 12, would travel with their mothers. And the boys, once they became around 12, would travel with the men. And so perhaps on the way up to Jerusalem, our Lord had been with his mother. But having fulfilled the feast and now being 12 years old, she must have thought, well, he's with St. Joseph. And Joseph must have thought he's with our Blessed Mother. How else would they not have realized his absence? So it was just one of those mix-ups, you might say, that our Lord allowed in their minds, that is, so that he could give us this lesson and give them this lesson. Now, four years ago, Jorge Bergoglio, who goes by the name of Pope Francis, gave a sermon on this gospel, and he uttered a terrible blasphemy. He said that our Lord, for this escapade, had later to apologize and ask forgiveness of Mary and Joseph. How could the Son of God be accused of some boyish mischief, doing something uh, that he would later have to ask forgiveness for? He is the, the creator of all. 
the master of the universe. So why then did our Lord do this? And once again, I would like to quote from Cornelius Alapid a little bit on the reasons our Lord absented himself from Mary and Joseph to teach them and all of us a lesson. The words of Christ are words of one instructing and consoling, excusing himself and defending what he has done, as if to say, there was no need for you to seek me, for you might have considered that I was beginning to deal with the business of the world's salvation, for which I was sent by my heavenly Father. Neither must you suppose that I shall always remain with you. Some day I shall leave you and go away to be about this business as I have already begun to do. Moreover, as for my going without your knowledge, I did so purposely to teach you that in these matters I depend not on you but on my heavenly Father and that I must act according to his will and his plan and not yours. It is not I then who have given you cause for sorrow, but partly your love for me and partly your ignorance of the mystery I have now told you of. You knew not that I was occupied with my father's business. Although this ought to have presented itself to your mind, your tender love prevented it. And she sought uh, and turned aside the thought. Hence, the venerable Bede says, He blames her not because she sought him as her son, but forces her to raise the eyes of her mind to what he owes him, whose eternal son he is. So again, putting the things of God first. Did you not know I must be about my father's business? And our Lord also teaches us with these words, that when it comes to a vocation, God's will must come first. And we can read this in the lives of various saints that they displeased or disappointed their parents when it came to following a vocation to give their life to God. And sometimes I notice in working with vocations, sometimes you can have a person who has a vocation, who rejects it because of attachment to family and not wanting to leave. But sometimes also, it can be that parents are unwilling to let a son or daughter go to follow a vocation because of their attachment to their family, to their son or daughter. And they must also remember, God's will must come first. It's interesting in regard to vocations that the Council of Trent, when it comes to seminaries, the Council of Trent said that there should be in every diocese a seminary in which boys from the age of 12 or 13 can follow a vocation. And so this practice of having minor seminaries was very common throughout our country, although in this country it normally did not begin until the age of about 14, 13 or 14, rather than 12 or 13. But again, the point here is that when God desires that a, a boy or girl, young man or young woman, give his or her life to him, then both for the person called and for the other members of the family, God's will must come first before human affection and human attachments. So these are the lessons that our Lord teaches us by this mystery. And he also, then, even after he gave this lesson, what did he do? He went with them to Naz Nazareth and was subject to them. He, their creator, was subject to them, his creatures. For what? For another 18 years, until the age of 30. Our Lord giving us the wonderful example of obedience to parents, and to all lawful authority. How pleasing to God is the, the humble subjecting of ourselves to those placed over us. Obedience requires humility. And obedience 
is a virtue very pleasing to God, of which our Lord gives us the example in today's gospel. So as you see, there are many lessons we all can reflect upon. Let us, in imitation of our Lord, always put the things of God first, but also fulfill all of our duties to our superiors by being subject to them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.